the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. When I was a kid with a bunch of Brussels sprouts and liver and onions, no joke, left on my plate, I would hesitantly ask in a half whisper, uh, Mother, may I please be excused? And it was futile. I already knew what the reply would be, and sure enough, it came as predictably as fog in San Francisco. Finish up what's on your plate. You are what you eat. Being a rather difficult child, I would protest, but I don't want to be Brussels sprouts or chopped liver. To which my mother retorted, it's vitamins, silly. You want to grow up to be big and strong. And so with the aid of a tall glass of milk, I choked down the remainder of my meal, trying to chew as little as possible. We intuitively understand the age-old parental advice that we are what we eat. It makes good sense. On the spiritual level, we can understand this as the stories we tell ourselves about ourselves, the stories we tell about others, and about God. We are a storied people. We understand the world according to narratives, and those stories have the power to shape how we see the world, relate to others, and work for freedom, justice, and peace. In the age of social media, the power of stories, the power of sound bites and memes to shape our reality is undeniable. The stories we imbibe, the narratives that we make our own and live by, have a profound effect on our actions. Spend time in an online white supremacist forum ingesting racialized rhetoric and stewing in a swamp of conspiracy theories, and it's predictable, entirely predictable, that you'll see an imminent threat in the face of every person who's different from you, who is other. As the computer people say, garbage in, garbage out. The Feast of the Transfiguration is a reminder that as Christians, we're called to listen to the story that relativizes all other stories, the story that is revealed in the gift of God's only Son and the person of Jesus. When Jesus takes Peter, John, and James up the mountain to pray, and is revealed in his raiment, white and glistening before their heavy-lidded eyes, a couple of important things are going on. By climbing up the mountain, they kind of go above the fray, so to speak. By climbing up the mountain, they get a little distance from all the other competing voices that clang around in the marketplace, in their heads, and in their hearts. Going up the mountain is really a symbol of stepping back from all the usual stories we tell ourselves about ourselves, about others, and about God, and making a little space for something new, for something true to emerge. We've all got stories we live by. For lots of people, it's some version of not enough. If we're people who internalize things, we tell ourselves that we're not rich enough, smart enough, skinny enough, spiritual enough, fill in the blank enough. If we're the type who externalizes things, we tell ourselves stories about how the problem is somehow out there. We can live according to a fond nostalgia for a bygone age that never really existed except in our idealized imaginations and measure everything according to its false light as always falling short, always not like it used to be, always a day late and a dollar short. Whether we internalize or externalize, the effect is the same. What's here, what's now, is somehow deficient, lacking and not enough. It's a place of poverty and grinding lack, driven by the story of deficit either in ourselves or in our environment. 
And so going up the mountain to pray is a way of saying that we need to identify the stories that run our lives, often unconsciously, in the company of Jesus, often in the context of prayer. We ask that these inhibiting stories might be brought to light, be seen through for the imprisoning, life-draining lies that they are. As Mike, Mark Twain, not Mike Twain, that's somebody else. Uh, Mark, Mark Twain says, uh, I've been through some terrible things in my life, some of which actually happened. That's a humorous but slightly scathing way of showing us the power, the thrall that stories can have over us. The great aid in developing a little self-knowledge of learning the stories we live by, and if we're honest, often expect others to live by as well, is attention. You will do well to be attentive, Peter says in our epistle today. You will be well, you will do well to be attentive. So often we are asleep, unaware, unconscious of the stories that are running our lives as we move through life on a kind of autopilot. This is the great challenge of the life of discipleship, to stay awake, to resist falling asleep, to recognize when we're falling into old patterns of thought, stale modes of seeing and being, and again, make a little room for something else. Make a little room for the light to get in and heal us, transfigure us, make us a little bit more like Christ. The truth is we like our stories about ourselves, others, and God, not because they bring us happiness, but for the simple reason that they are familiar. We erect little tents encampments of self-enclosure and hang out in the safe confines of what we already know. Watchfulness, watchfulness, what the Greek fathers call nepsis, is what helps us see these encampments for what they are, ways of insulating ourselves against the bracing, undefended freedom of life in Christ. Once we gain this little bit of self-knowledge, once we actually begin to know the stories we live by, there's a little chink in the armor that's opened up, as if someone has momentarily pressed pa the pause button on the tape loops that dominate our thinking. And there's an opportunity to listen to something new, to listen to the new song God is always already singing in the depths of our hearts in the person of Christ Jesus. And that's the second thing to notice about Jesus taking the disciples up the mountain. When Peter, James, and John see Jesus transfigured, a voice speaks from the cloud saying, this is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. As Christians, we find our true identity and calling in listening to Jesus in his birth, life, death, and resurrection as revealed in the Gospels, we learn a different story, a different story of who we are and who we are called to be. Like Mary, we self-forgetfully sit at the feet of Jesus and make our whole body an ear, an open, attentive, and receptive tent of meeting where the Word can transform us. At Jesus' baptism by John in the Jordan River, that same voice speaks from the torn open heavens. This is my son, my beloved, with whom I am well pleased. This pronouncement is not just about Jesus, though it is certainly that. It's about each and every person, each and every person without exception, being loved by God. You are my beloved daughter. You are my beloved son. And you, 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 I am well pleased. You are beloved, and there is nothing you can do to separate yourself from that. 
That is the story, the reality that the life of Christian discipleship asks us to live from. When we look to Jesus, when we place him first in all things, when we root and ground ourselves in him, we're making God's transfiguring love for us in Jesus through the Holy Spirit the foundational story of our lives. That's what it means for Jesus to have triumphed over the powers and dominions of this world. That's what it means when Jesus says in Luke, I saw Satan fall like lightning. Those are ways of talking about the power of recognizing our belovedness, the abundance that is always on offer here and now. When we let those old stories fall away, when we leave them on the plane. I remember speaking with a friend in seminary who had grown up just in an awful household, um, kind of unimaginable in many ways, where she was told she was lazy, stupid, ugly, you name it. And one day I ran into her and um, noticed that there was something qualitatively different about her. What's been going on, I asked. Oh, nothing really, she replied. Because you seem different somehow, lighter. Did you fall in love? Enter into therapy, go on medication, start exercising or something? And she had a good sense of humor, so she said, yes, well, all of those things actually. Uh, but that's not what's different. What's different, she said, is that I know that I'm loved unconditionally. And she said, I was drinking a cup of tea at breakfast, grinding through the same stories about my crappy life and how I'm a crappy person, when suddenly, in a moment of grace, I saw that it was all made up. It was all made up. I didn't have to believe that stuff anymore. And suddenly it was like this great feeling of peace welled up in me, almost from the soles of my feet. And I knew it was true. And I knew, she said, I knew I was home. The Feast of the Transfiguration is about Jesus' human and divine nature revealed, to be sure. But it's also about the transfiguration that happens when belovedness becomes the ground from which we live. Peter uses those beautiful images of the lamp shining in a dark place and of the morning star rising in the heart. When those cramped stories of not enough are left on the plane, it's as if a light that has always been shining in our hearts is finally glimpsed through the clouds of our thoughts inherited from teachers, parents, churches, and nation. And we see that just as we are, we are loved. And we see that just as we are, we are cherished. And we see that just as we are, we are enough. And once that reality breaks through the hard pan of our hearts, we suddenly find our own voice. It's a voice that proclaims with boldness the belovedness of all of God's children, that sees fear-mongering and scapegoating for what they are, and works to undo the power of those demonizing narratives in our city, our nation, and the world. We become bearers of a story not of exclusion, bearers of a story not of fear of the other, and scapegoating violence heaped on the back of innocent victims, but of a story of belovedness and welcome. Love rises like the morning star in our hearts, and we find ourselves walking in solidarity with those whose dignity as children of God, created in God's image and likeness, has been diminished or even flat out denied. Satan 
fell like lightning. Jesus' story has triumphed over every story. But the question for us to ponder is, what is our story? And what kind of fruit is it bearing in our lives? Is it time to listen to Him, to listen to Jesus, to find out who we really are? In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit.